Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to Inside the Writer's Studio, the podcast where we talk with writers about their lives, their craft, their business, and their latest work. I'm your host, Charlie Lovett, and our podcast is sponsored by Bookmarks. Bookmarks is a literary nonprofit whose programs include the largest annual book festival in the Carolinas. Come visit Bookmarks at our community gathering space and nonprofit independent bookstore in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Inside the Writer Studio is also proud to be an affiliate of Libro FM, the audiobook platform that supports your local independent bookstore. Stay tuned at the end of the podcast for more information on Libro FM and a special offer. My guest today is Elizabeth Silver, whose novel The Majority has just been published. Elizabeth, welcome to Inside the Writer Studio. Thank you for having me. So the majority imagines the life of a fictional first female justice of the United States Supreme Court. And it was inspired at least somewhat by the life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now, Justice Ginsburg was still alive when you started writing this novel, and you've written both fiction and nonfiction. What made you want to tell this story as a novel rather than as a nonfiction book? Oh, that's a great question. Um, You know, I was really interested in exploring the parts of women like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sandra Day O'Connor, other trailblazers um, that aren't told in the nonfiction that's out there, that aren't told in the biographies, kind of the dirty things, the things that would have been put on, like cut in the, uh, and put on the floor in like a film, you know, the cutting room floor. And so I wanted to know more about kind of the maybe the insecurities or the flaws or the doubts that these women have, because no doubt every woman has them. I have, everyone has these, has doubts um, and insecurities. And I was really interested in exploring that. I was interested in exploring the contradictions that abound in the human experience, particularly for people in the public eye. And so um, as somebody who went to law school, as somebody who writes both fiction and nonfiction, the only thing, you know, she, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was this icon to me. Um, and I, for personal personal reasons, you know, we're, we're both Jewish, li- lawyer component, lived in New York, you know, a lot of, I love opera, you know, a lot of little details like that. Um, it, you know, she was the person on the Supreme Court, independent of her, you know, uh, her um, legions of fans and devo- devotion. Um, she was the person that I looked to as somebody who um, felt more representative for me personally. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was her life that really uh, I connected with but it was just the inspiration and the jumping off point because then I really wanted to create a completely new person um, that does have flaws <laughs> and that does have and I kind of question all of her choices um, and show how, you know, it, it's ordinary people who do sometimes make it to these extraordinary places in life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Sylvia Olin certainly is her own person is not it's not just, you know, Justice Ginsburg with it with a different name. Um, and we'll get into some of the differences as we go along. Now, Ginsburg was I, poss- possibly most famous for her dissents, um, which often meant that she was in the minority. But your book is called The Majority. And and reading your book actually taught me a lot about the relationship between the majority and the minority in the judicial world that I didn't really know before. W- why did you choose the title The Majority? And can you talk a little bit about the unique place of the minority in, in the American court system? Yeah, well, you know, the the title went through a few changes, actually, (laughs) um, as all titles do, right? And so um, the majority actually means several things. Obviously, it's the majority rule, you know, the majority opinion in a a decision becomes the law, the common law. And so that's, that's one meaning. And the other meaning really focuses on the fact that women are the majority uh, population in America and yet the minority in power. Um, and I really was interested in exploring that because it is about this woman who is, um, you know, trailblazing and leading the way to change for women in America over the 20th century. Um, and uh, and so that's kind of one, that's one reason. But I think another thing that um, is really interesting and really kind of struck me when years ago when I was in law school um, was kind of the power of the dissent, but not just for kind of that idea of a white dissent. And I'm going to voice my opinion about this as RBG and other justices, especially, especially now, are very famous for doing. But it's this idea of, you know, in America, we do actually publish the the minority opinion, which is something I think that um, we shouldn't take for granted and that we should really um, applaud. Um, and so in many ways that the minority opinion, which is often written as a dissent, um, can eventually become a majority opinion or becomes um, a part of our, our common law system that does in fact um, project change in the future. 
Yeah, I mean, you readers, you will learn it. I don't want to make it sound like this is a, a legal class because it's really a fascinating and and read that moves along. But you'll learn constitutional law on on the journey in this book. <laughs> uh, and I love the parts where you sort of showed how a minority opinion from fifty or sixty or seventy years ago, you know, some of the wording in that opinion becomes in the majority opinion or in legislation. Um, yeah. To, to address the, the issues at hand, you know. I think but, it's interesting because I think when you're looking at, at, at it, particularly again now, because the Supreme Court um, session just ended, I think, you know, it's something that people can think about. Why why are the justices putting so much language into these dissents? And yeah. I think that they're, they know that it could set groundwork for future um, future changes in some capacity. Yeah. So you, you have a degree in creative writing, which is not unusual for a novelist, but you also have a law degree. Tell us a little bit about your own legal background and how you drew on that when you were working on this novel. Sure. So I um, I got my creative writing degree first um, because I, I, I writing was, you know, what I wanted to do. And I also wanted to, you know, I needed to figure out what that day job was going to be. And I wasn't sure at the time. And so I tried teaching and I tried, which I love now and I teach now. Um, but I, you know, I worked in publishing. I, I taught ESL. I freelanced as a journalist. I did all of the the, the jobs that I thought writers had. Um, and then I and then I decided, let me try law school. And so I was actually really interested in law as um, law kind of theoretically and conceptually. The practice of law is a little different. Um, but I went to uh, law school several years after um, after my MFA, and I was actually spending most of my law school career um, writing fiction at night. And so, you know, my first year I, I went at night and I was teaching freshman English at a couple universities in Philadelphia and then going to law school at night and learning legal writing and kind of undoing it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, you know, in, in a sense, um, one was kind of always serving each other. But now, years later, I, I see how they've actually helped each other. Um, and I end up writing, not everything I write is about the law, but um, I'm interested in kind of the narrative component of it um, and to see how how it influences our behavior and how it reflects it. Um, but for the most part, I kind of like let it, I'm like kind of like 90% writer, 10% lawyer, <laughs> and somehow it finds its way. In. And so right now um, I, uh, I I write full time, but I, I I still keep a foot in the law by with pro bono work and um, a lot of legal journalism and um, you know obviously in, in fiction as well. Yeah, yeah. So there, you know, we have a lot of novels on the show, and I read a lot of novels that will <clears throat> sort of obliquely engage with social issues like reproductive rights or abortion or gender bias or civil rights and um, but this, the way this novel is written uh, and the subject of this novel allows you to not be oblique at all. It allows you to confront some of those issues really head on. Um, and I thought it was amazing how you were able to weave so many of these issues into the story in a way that felt organic to the narrative. It didn't feel like you were sort of pressing an issue in where, where it didn't belong. Oh, well, thank you. When you started this, did, did you set out to write, for want of a better term, a, a relevant novel? And what do you see as the as the is, as the relationship between sort of issues and story? Ooh, you know, I, I think if any any novelist or any writer sets out to you know like write something that's quote unquote relevant, by the time it, it it's published, it will probably not be relevant. <laughs> or the world will have changed so so much in that time frame. So um, I feel as though that is potentially quite um, a challenging uh, proposition. I, I wrote this book, when I wrote this book, um, RBG was alive and well um, and on the court. And um, it was very much this idea of, okay, well, this is a woman in, in her 80s and so much of our country, depending on where you fall, you know, it's like it's, it's, it's in this one woman's hands, which seems kind of wild for um, a country, um, any country, but a country like ours, right? And so um, I I didn't necessarily set out to write it as being relevant. And it's been six years approximately since I wrote the first line to, you know, to its publication. So, so much has changed in that time frame. In fact, I even sold the book before, while Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still alive. And so um, the world has changed substantially in that time frame, particularly the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has evolved so much in that time frame. So um, I don't, I don't know that that was kind of an intent to, at the moment. For me, it was, it was honestly less about 
law or the Supreme Court that led me to want to write this book more about my experience as a new mother. Mm -hmm. um, and in some of those issues that you were just talking about in terms of reproductive health or um, the, the issue that, I, that that Sylvia really focuses on is kind of pregnancy discrimination and um, bias that society has. And it's something that's really, you can't really, you, you can try in the law, but it's really about social norms and biases that we have. And so how do you um, legislate those? But, you know, I, I had been reading so many books and um and loving them but so many novels do kind of talk around the issue um the issues at, at hand or the issues of the day and it's not a bad thing it's a wonderful thing but um i you know by having it directly be about a woman who is directly dealing with these issues it wasn't even an attempt to say okay i'm gonna create a narrative that circumvents this issue to talk about it it's just like yeah i'm just gonna go right there <laughs> let's just write it into the plot yeah one of the things i noticed with with sylvia and with her interaction with some of the people around her is that i'm say for instance on the issue of pregnancy bias you know she's she's trying to move one step forward and there are people who want her to move 10 steps forward <laughs> and and i think you grapple really well with this issue and, and i know a lot of you know i'm i'm 60 years old so i've seen a lot of ebb and flow with with social issues over my life um but i know a lot of young people who are very frustrated that uh you only move one step forward at a time or that you move two steps forwards and one and a half steps back. Uh, can you talk a little bit about about how Sylvia deals with that that issue of having having pressure from her friends and her peers to do more and but at the same time understanding that if she does anything, it's better than doing nothing? Yeah, I think it's a it's an internal conflict that she has that I think that kind of uh, our country probably has in general, no matter where you are in this country, this idea of how does progress work? Um, what does that look like? And how do you achieve it? And I think that she because she has these influences that are so diverse around her and she has different people kind of um, showing her their versions of what power might be right or their versions of what success might be she takes a little bit of that in and kind of creates her own form of that and i think she realizes um through her experiences um in law school as a parent um with her um the, the from the history of the holocaust that her cousin um really influenced her for who is a survivor um comes and lives with them when she's a child she she learns okay how how can i do something that actually will help people um so that the bad things in history don't repeat themselves. Um, and she picks up a little bit of each, you know, of different approaches. Um, and, you know, I, she says at some point, the idea of progress is kind of like you're caught in a zipper. And I think that the idea of when something gets caught in a zipper, you, you have to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to un untoggle it or untangle it or whatever <laughs> the right metaphor would be. But um, once you get past that little knot or that tangle, then you can, you can complete the zipper. And I think that human nature doesn't doesn't want to accept that we have a hard time with that i have a hard time with that you know we we don't want to go back and forth and back and forth a bunch of little times until we can move forward but when we're in a society in which people are different and we need to work together and somehow figure out a way to do that and it does go back and forth a little bit before um, moving forward as she learns now, we, we've talked a lot on this podcast about historical novels and about different ways of writing them. Some people like to pick a historical figure and write a, a novelized version very much of what happened to them. Other people put fictional characters in the past. Um, and you, what you've done is you've taken the inspiration from a historical figure and then created a, a fictional figure. Can you tell us, without giving away too much, can you tell us a little bit about what parts of Justice Ginsburg you really wanted to include in Sylvia and then what what parts are drawn from your own imagination or from other sources? Sure. Um, I think, you know, her childhood is um, a lot of strong inspiration. So she um, she's from Brooklyn. She's Jewish. Um, her mother dies. Um, I'm not going to say much more about that. You know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's mother died when, when she was quite young. Um, she has a daughter. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has multiple children. Um, but, uh, but the, you know, and the other thing that she has a, a beautiful marriage. Um, and I think that that's something that Ruth Bader, Ruth Bader Ginsburg also had with Marty Ginsburg. But really, it, it, it diverges very soon. Um, you know, it, it diverges almost immediately. Um, 
even in the childhood, but past the childhood. And I realized that um, if I wanted to create a novel that stood on its own and independent characters and, and, and a book that worked, I had to separate them entirely. And so she has a kind of a, she has that cute nickname or the whatever nickname, she's the contemptuous SOB, yeah. or Sylvia <laughs> Bernstein. So that's obviously a nod to the notorious RPG. But beyond that, you know, she, she doesn't look like her. Um, the, you know, she's she's tall and she's blonde. In many ways, her physicality is more like Sandra Day O'Connor's or other people's. Um, and so she, you know, she really diverges very soon and takes on her own challenges, her own path. And in that sense, she is just, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the other, you know, female Supremes are really just a jumping off point yeah. to explore the story, um, to explore that idea of, of um, you know, one woman's path to, to power in America and what that looks like. So this novel is told, um, not only is it told in the first person, but it's told sort of retrospectively. We begin, um, we have, a, I think, 84-year-old woman saying, hey, I'm going to tell you the story of my life. Um, so voice is extremely important. I mean, I think voice is important in, in in any work, but especially in a first person work. Can can you talk about finding Sylvia's voice and did did Justice Ginsburg contribute to that at all, either through your listening to her or reading her opinions or or, or is Sylvia's voice a hundred percent her own? You know, at, at first there was a lot of RBG in there. And that that is when I, I went into a lot of problems in early drafts. And that was when I really had to separate them. And I had a good writer friend suggest, you know what, because I was stuck. And she said, just change how she looks. I think at the beginning and early, early drafts, I was trying to kind of emulate her too much. Yeah. And the minute I changed how she looked and changed very a lot of facts about her life, it really started taking off. And so, um, you know, I, I think that you know, a book that covers a large lifespan of any character goes, I mean, every every book goes through, goes through thousands of drafts, but um, this one, which covers so much time, um, it went through quite a lot of drafts because I had to figure out, well, how old is she when she's telling this story? And it's really, it's written as a fictional memoir. It's written as a memoir of a woman looking back on her life, knowing that she's famous and wanting to kind of set, set the record straight. Um, but figuring out which times of your life you know I, I my second book is a memoir and i teach memoir as well and one of the things i always tell my students is okay in a memoir you're telling a particular um you're exploring a particular issue you're taking a particular time but you can't use every part of your life you have to kind of pick the particular scenes that will represent that moment and i found that challenge in this as well okay well what arrows am i going to explore what are the moments that really made her who she is and so it's really focused on four different times in her life um and and each voice you know had to be kind of consistent with that time and you have to see kind of her grow over her lifetime at least the lifetime that shows in the book yeah and and one of the when you're i love what you said about having to choose these moments because this is a novel that covers 40 or 50 years and and you know it's a reasonable length novel <laughs> um <laughs> But what I think what the most important moment for any novelist to choose is where do you begin? Um, now you begin with this with the prologue that sort of sets up that this person is going to be a Supreme Court justice and that this is a, a as you said a, a, a memoir uh, of her life. And then you go back to the first historical event, which is the arrival of Mariana in the household. What tell tell us why you chose that particular moment and and tell us a little bit about that character. So Mariana is um, Sylvia's cousin, her older cousin who survives the Holocaust and comes to live with her family in Brooklyn in this in their tiny apartment. Um, and and so though she's only eight, nine years older than her, she very much serves as kind of this this guy, this mother figure, um, another influence in her life that really dictates who she becomes. And I. I also come from a family of Holocaust survivors, so that really influenced me um, in in so many aspects. And this idea of, um, I remember my grandmother who survived Auschwitz, so the one thing she would always say, you know, education is the one thing they can't take away from you. Um, and so that was kind of a mantra in my life, um, and probably a large part of why I went to law school. And so I think that for Sylvia, she has this woman who lost her education, wasn't able to pursue education because of, of, you know, of the Nazis and it was taken away and it's, um, you know, that's all backstory, but she comes in and she's like this huge kind of 
wildfire in, in Sylvia's life and really changes how she thinks because she's very matter of fact. And she's very much, okay, we, we can't let things like this happen in America. Um, you have to do something about it. You're smart. You're going to change this. You're going to make sure that this doesn't happen. And so there's a moment in which when Mariana comes to live with them that she's kind of, she says that there's a, there's a time in your life in which you realize it's beginning. And for her, it was really when Mariana came to live with, with them because it really set her on that trajectory of um, finding that higher purpose, but also what, feeling almost in a sense like she um, is required to for whatever kind of familial obligation or sense of um, survivorship. Yeah, and and Mariana and her her presence, which is, you know, it's not an overwhelming presence at first. She's she's very quiet at the beginning, um, but it really drove home for me some of the ways in which the Holocaust, which which we can, if we're not careful, think of as just sort of a European event, um, mm -hmm. really affected America in general and and New York City in particular. Um, can can you talk a little bit about how how Sylvia is shaped by these events of of World War II, even though you know she wasn't directly involved in it in any way? Well, absolutely. I mean, by living, um, by by being alive at the time, but just a child, she wouldn't necessarily have been consciously aware of everything. But the minute Mariana lives with them, she that that comes into her into her bedroom in many ways. And so the idea of you know life and death, or a, or things being taken away from you as quickly as they're given to you, is something that's acute. Um, uh, in, in her existence. Um, what's more is, you know, because it's at a time in which um, a, there were Holocaust survivors coming, but also so many were also, um, refugees were also not allowed in. She under, she's, she's learning this early on. And so it, it's at a very, she's 12 when Mariana comes to live with her in, in 1949. And so she sees how at, at a very influential age, um, how life can change. She sees what you know, what can happen in other places can impact her, how kind of hate can take hold and destroy, um, destroy lives, destroy people, destroy communities. Um, and so I think that having that very early influence really defines that. And also by being in New York, where a lot of people did come yeah. um, after the Holocaust, she was able to interact with them and get to know um, a little bit more about what happened. And, 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 and she's also kind of questioning, like, is this a story that that Mariana wants to talk about. What does that mean? And it shows kind of also different ways in which people process trauma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You you mentioned briefly that you your own family has has a Holocaust history. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that and how it helped you define some of the events and relationships in the novel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my grandparents survived the Holocaust. My grandmother was in Auschwitz. She was very young. She was uh, in her early 20s. My grandfather was actually on Schindler's List. Um, and my father was a hidden infant survivor. So he was born in um, a Rodham Poland ghetto in 1942. And so and his story of survival is just extraordinary. Basically, he was um, uh, my grandparents, when they knew they were being taken away to the camps, they um, basically put this little baby um, and gave them to this woman named Mariana or Marisha, who um, was uh, a Polish woman who was hiding my great grandfather, I want to say, my great grandfather during the whole war. And she ended up um, basically taking him to an orphanage. Um, and he was adopted by a whole other family for the first two, three years of his life. And so um, at the end of the war, my grandparents, my grandfather was relatively healthy because he was on Schindler's List and my grandmother was on another um, uh, exchange like Schindler's List called the Wallenberg Exchange and were covering in Sweden. So when they came back to Poland, they said, okay, we're coming back for our son. We're coming back for our son. Because of Marisha, um, they knew where he was. And so she had this role in my life as this woman who, in so many ways, um, kind of it, it played a huge part in saving my father. So several years ago, um, my son is seven when he was like one years old, one year old. Um, we did a big family trip to Poland to kind of trace his steps for the first time. And I found out that Marisha had just died a couple years earlier. And so we visited her grave and that's where I saw the name Mariana. And that was her that was her name is Mariana and we Marisha was the nickname that we had always referred to her as so um I named Mariana after after her for for that reason wow wow 
Um, when when Mariana is uh, when her when her mother dies, she's not allowed to be one of the official mourners because she's female. And this and and, and, and I'm sorry. When when Sylvia's mother dies, uh, mm -hmm. neither she nor Mariana are allowed to be in the in the official mourning party. And uh, she kind of con Sylvia confronts the rabbi about this. Um, and and at one point, Mariana says. Um, that she's not going to change the rabbi's mind about the role of women in Judaism. And I don't wonder if you could speak to this idea that, that I think Justice Ginsburg was such a model of, of how we coexist with people whose minds we know we're not going to change. Hmm. She did that very, very well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And uh, Sylvia, I'm not sure that she, I think she always does try to change people's minds. And yeah. I think that, um, and, and I think that they, they probably both do this. This is probably one of their similarities, but finding ways to do that in an effective way, um, because we can all try to change other people's minds. It's just how we go about it. Um, it, it varies. And I think that's where we have varying levels of success. And I think so. So <clears throat> Sylvia does try to, you know, she Mariana, you know, so you're not going to change him. He's he's very old school. Um, and Sylvia does still try to change his mind um, later on and you know, she she tries to she she wants to be a part of this no matter what. Um, and so, you know, but for, for her, this idea of I'm I'm precluded from the formal mourning of my own mother is a huge turning point for her. And so she looks very much at kind of Jewish law as a model of necessarily law, the idea of, OK, these are these are these are stories that are written down. These are rules that are open to interpretation. And it, it very much models how we do look at, at law today. Um, whether you look at it as, you know, in, in strict scrutiny or you look at it with evolving sense of interpretation, changing the times. And so I think, you know, that moment um, really led her to think, okay, and, and Los Mar allowed Mariana to see her confront a position of authority but not doing it through necessarily screaming or loud sounds, but quietly in a sense by, hey, let me take a step back, take time, research this, write about it, and then I'm gonna go talk to you with all of the information that I have. And because I know I'm right, right? She's gonna spend the time in making sure that she understands something before she responds. Yeah, and essentially what she does is she hands the rabbi a dissenting opinion, which I think is just, yeah. you know, I just love this, the, 12 year old girl handing a sheet of papers to the I rabbi. love that you called that a dissenting opinion. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sylvia's, Sylvia discovers that her mother um, has a bank account under the name of Mrs. Marty Olin. And she writes, I wouldn't have known that her own name on any of those checks would have been illegal in most states at the time. Um, you know, we're living in a time now where it, it feels a little bit like, like women's rights, civil rights, LGBT rights are, are moving backwards. Give us a sense of, of what the position of women was legally in the United States in 1949 when this when this novel begins. Oh, it, it was not it was not good. Um, you know, it's certainly in terms of social elements, you know, at, at the time women were 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 not meant to be attorneys or be physicians or have a bat mitzvah, which is a, you know a big an issue for Sylvia um, at the moment at, at, in her childhood. Um, and you know they were in in all states at at 1949 women were not allowed to take out bank accounts in their own name um pregnancy discrimination was legal until 1978 um 1974 i believe is when women could take out credit cards in their own name and this shocked me because um i remember i was in law school and i had an american legal history teacher talk to me about to like tell us this and i was blown away and this is i was in my my 20s in law school, not thinking, you know, thinking we had come so far. And just a few decades earlier, my own law professor was not allowed to take out a credit card in her own name. And that that blew my mind. And this, you know, we think that we've come so far in such a long time frame, but it, it's such a short time frame in which um, we, we women, and I think that the idea of your name isn't even on a bank account, uh, and your name is not even your own, is really um, illustrative of this. And 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 um and it's not to say that it's it's a it's the wrong decision to to change your name. It's just at, in 1949 when she's looking at at the this bank account, um, it doesn't have her mother's name on it anywhere, even though it's technically hers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. There were, um, I, I'm going to warn my readers uh, that when you read this novel, you're going to want to have a highlighter uh, because there's so many <laughs> great sentences that you're just going to want to go, I need to remember that. I need to Aww. have a T-shirt that has that on it. Um, <laughs> and um, but you say something very powerful at one point about about both the law and about storytelling. You say, the law is inherently based in narrative. Whoever writes the law controls the narrative. Can, can you expand a little bit on the relationship between law and narrative and also on, on this notion of, of whoever it is that writes the laws controls the narrative of marginalized groups like, like women and other minorities? Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, you've hit upon, I'm fascinated with that intersection of law and narrative. And I think that, you know, this, this is what I did love about law school. This is what I do love about the law is the idea of, um, you know, it, it, it is a powerful force, but um, the reality is there's the cliche, whoever, you know, tells the best story is going to win the case, you know, and in trial, but I think it goes so much deeper than just, you know, who's going to win the case um, in like a, a procedural, right? Um, who, who's going to tell the best story. Um, you know, the way the law has been written and always was written um, for hundreds of years is from a singular perspective. Um, and I think that, you know, like, for example, reproductive rights have been um, put as a women's um, health abortion is a women's issue, but it's not because two people are involved in this, but because it's been um, told, the story has been told, oh, as this is, this is because um, women get pregnant, it is therefore their issue, um, and men have been writing that law, therefore it makes it, it, it otherizes them in, in a sense, instead of including um, everyone in, in, in this story. Um, and the bottom line is we are a collection of stories. Um, our lives are a collection of stories, and how we tell them is going to influence how we're legislated and who chooses to legislate who chooses to lead is also going to lead from a particular perspective and it's also they're also going to lead from you know with a particular narrative i mean people talk about this all the time it's advertising you know how, how are you selling a story how are you selling a, a product a drink a piece of food you know anything at all clothing it's everything comes from a narrative. And I think that law is no different. And so in order for um, the narrative to change for marginalized people, um, more marginalized people need to be telling that narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's a, that really struck me when, when Sylvia chooses the case that she's gonna pursue um, for this whole issue of pregnancy discrimination. She talks about how um, you know, these cases kept coming across her desk and she got, oh, this one is a good story. Um, mm -hmm. This one has a good story behind it. And it was, so it was more than just, uh, I mean, it had specific legal aspects behind it also that made it a powerful case, but it was more than just those, those legal aspects. I think because, you know, at the end of the day, people, you, you have, you're, you're telling the story to, to people as well. It's not just to a judge. It's not just to, to a jury, right? You are also trying to tell your story and, 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 and people are going to tune out if there's nothing, if there's no narrative involved. I mean, that's literally the, I mean, that with this book, it's, it's a, it's a narrative, but we're exploring the law as part of it, but the 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 focus is ultimately about a personal story, yeah. um, and I think that's that because we're people. We want to connect with other people. We want to hear stories. We want to relate. Um, and if it's just dry law, no one, myself included, will have any interest in it. Yeah, uh, and and the the flip side of that law being narrative is is what you just said that you're speaking to to people, um, and in some cases you're speaking to nine justices on the Supreme Court. And Sylvia says that while justices should rule on the law, it's impossible for a judge not to consider their own experience of the world when they're making that decision. And she says, something, again, something that really struck home with me. She said, otherwise, every Supreme Court decision would be 9-0 um, if, if, if people's personality and, and backgrounds didn't, didn't come into it. Can you talk a little bit about that idea um, in, in jurisprudence that that yes, it's the law, but it's also who you are. And how do we how do we get justice in a, in a system like that? Um, yeah, I, I I mean it's a challenge. Um, I I think that the the re the reality is yes, on its face, the law does suggest and does say that okay, you cannot take. Your own personal experience into consideration as you're adjudicating a case and that is what every um judicial um committee will ask every prospective 
judge or justice as they are being appointed to a court, especially to a lifetime appointment. Um, and this is something that judges will tell juries like, oh, wait, you didn't hear that. You have to strike that from your memory and not consider that while you're looking at determining whether or not somebody is guilty or not guilty. And on its face, that's that's great in theory, right? But in, in reality, in human nature, that's almost impossible to truly separate. And so I think that there are people, yes, you can do your best to separate that say like, oh, this is what I would be I believe, but I see that the law says something different. And I do think that judges and justices do at least try to do this, or at least many of them do. But at the same time, we are a collection of our experiences, right? We're a collection of our lived experiences. And it's impossible to take that apart because that forms our perspective that informs our the way we interpret anything right so it determines if you're uh you know if you, if you are originalist or not you know it, it if you're an activist it determines all of those things so your lived experience is going to get to you to your ultimate view of interpretation and and that is a way in which you can't really separate um completely the uh, ability to say, I'm not taking my personal opinions into consideration here. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sylvia says something rather wonderful about, it's about memoir, it's about memory, it's about storytelling. She says, some memories are preserved in pure form, others are more elusive and in recollection imbued with invented detail. To what extent does Sylvia sort of create her own story with, invented detail. I mean, we're listening to the story told from a very specific point of view, from the point of view of the person who, who lived these events, but other people live these events too. Uh, how, how much is how much is Sylvia, you know, filling in the gaps with, with in, what she calls invented detail? Oh, I love that question. Um, you know, I think that 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 goes to the reality of of in the the problem of memory. Um, and so I think that idea, you know, you we, we all have those um, those optical illusions in which like letters are missing, but somehow you can read the word still, and you, they they just come to you because the brain plays tricks on you, or the brain is this incredible organ that can really fill in the gaps. And I think that it's more like the brain can fill in the gaps. Um, where memory sometimes fails. Um, and so I think in that sense, you know, our childhoods, for example, um, I mean, I'm, myself, I, I, I struggled to remember certain parts of my childhood, which weren't even that long ago, but I remember them and they have to be stimulated in order for me to remember them. And so I think that line was really referring to that idea of, okay, I am telling my story, but we have to, we have to acknowledge as in all memoir, um, and with all narrators, the, the fallibility of memory. And so what one person remembers might be different for another person. Um, so for example, you know, looking at the relationship of Linda and Sylvia, um, I think is a good example of memory um, being true to each of these characters, but existing quite differently in, in reality. Well, there's so much more we could talk about with this novel. I don't, but I don't want to give away too many things. But the relationship <laughs> between Sylvia and her husband and her daughter, her college roommate Linda, who you mentioned, uh, who has a, you know an amazingly interesting arc of her own that intersects with Sylvia in different in different ways. Um, but I I want to I want to finish with a you know I heard one interviewer ask you a question: What do you want women to take away from this novel? And I'd like to broaden that, if I may, because I don't think this is a novel that's just for women. I think any reader, I mean, I'm not a woman. I thought this was a fantastic novel and a great read. So what would you like readers, regardless of their gender, to, to take away from this novel? Oh, thank you for that. Um, I, I, I do hope that it, men and women alike will read this book because it is yeah. not meant just for women. It's meant for everyone. Um, I, you know, well, a, I hope that they're entertained. <laughs> I hope that they, you know, they turn the pages and that they're engaged in the story um, and that, uh, you know, they, they, you know, spend several hours just, you know, connecting with these people um, and that it was worthwhile. Um, but I, I, you know, I think at the, I, I'd also like them to take a look at at, at uh, the way our country works and kind of explore that idea of like, okay, we, we do live in narrative is, even though law is law, you know, it's intersection with narrative um, is important. So everybody has a story to tell, big or small, no matter where you are. And each story is important because each story makes up the fabric of, um, of, of uh, you know, these issues of our country, of progress, of everything. And so um, I, I hope that people will kind of look in 
inside and say, okay, I have a story to tell too. Yeah. And I think it's also a wonderful, back, you know, pulling focus back a little bit um, from, from just the law to see how the stories of all the people who's, who Sylvia's life intersects with create her own story, how, how her husband's story, her daughter's story, her friend's story, Mariana's story, her mom's story, her dad's story, you know, these all make her who, who she is. Um, Absolutely. I think, I mean, and, and that's true. Like we, we, we don't, we all are influenced by the, the people who are closest to us in our life. And I think, you know, it's, it, it's a struggle also with people. I think when, like I was saying earlier, I teach memoir and I think when you're trying to tell your story, you realize, okay, well, I can't just tell my story because there's all these other people who are so close to me that are in, in, integral in, in that story. And how do you do that? Well, you're not, you didn't, you're not who you are alone. You're who you are because of these powerful influences in your life. Yeah, yeah. We like to end every episode of Inside the Writer's Studio with the same 10 questions. Um, you should be able to answer each in just a few words, but hopefully they'll give us some insight into you and into your writing. So if you're ready, we'll begin. Let's go. What word do you love to work into your writing? What word do I love to work? I mean, there's certain words that I feel like every draft I have is a word that I've overused and I have to <laughs> find it in retrospect and cut it out. Um, but what word do I love? I love this. I don't know if I'd like to work this into my writing, but I'm obsessed with the word apothecary and I don't know why. I just love it. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It's not in this book at all, but I love that word. What word do you hate to encounter in other people's writing? I don't know. I, I, it's like phrases, you know, like I think sometimes people overuse phrases in terms of descriptions of like, of anxiety, you know, um, like, oh, the, the heart fluttered or something like that, you know, as a, as a representative of, of the emotions of the time. And so I think that it's, it, you know, those descriptions are used a lot. Um, I don't know if there's a specific word that I hate other people using. Um, Where, so much. Where's your favorite place to write? It depends on the day. I have a home office, which I love writing when and when no one's here. Um, but I also, you know, my, the the reality is probably my favorite place is to write or, or writers retreats or writer residencies where I can just completely get away um, and have a space that's devoted to just writing for a few weeks at a time, or a few days at a time, even. And so, just having separation, I think, um, is really magical in terms of of writing new new work. Where could you never write? Oh, goodness. I mean, it's making me think of all the places I have right. I probably want to strike that last one. I love writing on airplanes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's probably one of my favorite because it is one of those, like, I, I, I don't have access to the internet. I don't, I'm not with people or if I'm with people, it's like, it's just pure, you know, disconnect. And I actually really love writing on airplanes. Um, and I, which probably means that I have a hard time probably writing at a, outside. I don't like writing outside on, on a, because the glare on the computer screen. To what rule of grammar do you pay least attention? Oh, well, I have two really, I have two little kids in elementary school and they're learning, oh, don't start a sentence with and and but. And I love <laughs> starting sentences with yep. and and but. Yep. I think they're wonderful. What was the first book you remember reading? The first book I remember reading and loving was Charlotte's Web. Um, I remember closing that book and going into my parents' room and saying, I cried, I finished this book, and it was so meaningful to me. And uh, that, that left a lasting impression. What are you reading now? I am reading, um, well, I'm reading several books at, at the same time, um, but I am reading uh, a holding pattern and I'm reading, um, I, I want to show them to you, but um, Half Life of a Stolen Sister by uh, Rachel Cantor. What book would you like to have written? Ooh. Um, anything by Jennifer Egan. <laughs> I think she's just a phenomenal. She's just, she is, you cannot get better than her. What sort of book would you like to write, but probably never will? Oh, I don't know if I want to say I probably never will. I, I feel like I don't want to put that. That makes me, I don't want to put that out there. Um, but I have in my, I, I'm obsessed with Broadway <laughs> show too. It's musical theater. And I have like, and I keep saying every year, I'm going to write like a murder mystery set on Broadway. So Sign me I up there, hope right? I can write that one day. <laughs> and finally, what would you like to hear a reader tell you? I loved it. <laughs> 
This has been Inside the Writer's Studio. I'm your host, Charlie Lovett, and my guest today has been Elizabeth Silver, whose novel, The Majority, is available wherever books are sold. Elizabeth, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Inside the Writer's Studio is sponsored by Bookmarks, a literary nonprofit that runs the largest annual book festival in the Carolinas and operates a community gathering place and nonprofit independent bookstore in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. To find out more about Bookmarks and all its programs, visit www.bookmarksnc.org. Inside the Writer's Studio is proud to be affiliated with Libro FM. Unlike other audiobook platforms, Libro FM supports your local independent bookstore. Whether you buy a single book or, like me, a monthly subscription, you can link your account to your local store or to Bookmarks to support literary community. For a special two-for-one offer, go to Libro.fm and use the discount code WRITERS. If you've enjoyed Inside the Writer's Studio, please consider leaving a rating or review online at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Inside the Writer's Studio posts new episodes on the 1st and 15th of every month. I'm back from my early summer hiatus, so look for new episodes in August and September as we prepare for the annual Bookmarks Festival in Winston-Salem on September 23rd. Until then, thanks for joining us, and may you read with wonder and write with passion. (laughs) 